second in a series of three webinars on top challenges and best advice for working in the legislative environment. My name is Luke Martell. I work in the Fiscal Affairs Department and am part of the Young and New Professionals Organizing Committee here at NCSL, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is titled, What Drives You? Retention and Motivation, and will focus on what keeps people in their job. How important is the work-life balance, telecommuting, pay, flexibility, career lattice, coworkers, microculture, and the intangibles? Is there more to motivation than this? Learn about what motivates people to do a good job. A few housekeeping items before we introduce our speaker. These webinars are designed to be short and informative. The webinar will last 15 to 20 minutes and will be followed by Q&A. If you have questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box on the right side of your screen. These webinars will be recorded and will be posted on the NCSL website. We are fortunate today to have Kathy Nesbitt, Director of Personnel for the State of Colorado and Executive Director of the Department of Personnel and Administration with us as our speaker today. Kathy was appointed to this position by Governor John Hickenlooper in January 2011. She creates and administers the rules that govern the state of Colorado's 33,000 plus classified employees as well as their compensation and benefits. Kathy drafted significant personnel legislation and worked with the state legislature to introduce a statewide ballot initiative that had employee union support and passed with 56% of the vote. This is the first significant change to Colorado's personnel system in 92 years and previous attempts to pass a similar legislation had failed. Among many impressive career accomplishments, under her leadership, the state of Colorado conducted its first employee engagement survey. She created a statewide new employee orientation program, instituted major enhancements in the state training and development center, and launched a wellness program for the state's employees. Kathy has spent the majority of her career as a labor and employment attorney and possesses her senior professional in human resources certification. Also, earlier this month, Governing Mag Magazine recognized Kathy as one of its public officials of the year for 2013. Congratulations, Kathy, and without further delay, thank you. Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I am happy to be speaking with you today, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing with you some of the challenges that we faced in Colorado. Um, I'll spend a little bit more time discussing some of the things that motivate staff and what you can do as leaders um, to help improve either retention or motivation within your workforce. And then at the end, we'll wrap it up with a few questions. I'd like to start by just telling a little bit of a story. When I took uh, the position that I have about three years ago, I was pretty appalled and surprised about how the second largest employer in the state of Colorado managed its workforce. And as you've just heard, one of the significant elements of that was our infrastructure when it comes to human resources. And uh, there's two sort of parts to that. One is the rules and processes that we put in place in terms of managing a workforce of that size, and then the other is the systems that we use in terms of managing it. So I want to I talk a little bit about that. Um, a little history about Colorado um, and our human resources administration. We have a 92-year-old personnel system, and we are only one of four in the country that had its personnel rules embedded in the Constitution. And while that's important for those of you on the, on the call today, if you are in a state who still manages your personnel through your constitution, you'll be faced with a similar challenge that we did. How do you make change happen when you have to go to a statewide ballot initiative to get that done? Um, just a couple of notes there. I certainly think that it's important to, to get your executive leadership, the governor, et cetera, engaged with that, your legislature involved and supportive of making change happen in your state, I think is also important. And then if you also are in a collective bargaining state or you have partnership agree agreements in place with your unions, it's also important that you get them on board. It will make the process much easier in terms of making um, improvements and making change happen in your state. Um, when you talk about, we talk about the uh, talent agenda, we did try to modernize our systems. Um, we use a, a system that is fairly antiquated, um, and we are looking, hopefully within the next year if our budget um, goes through, we will be looking at replacing that system. I think it's important to note uh, for administrators out there, 
that's another way of actually making some improvements. We are now um, basically calling agencies and gathering information and putting information on spreadsheets to be able to discern how many full-time employees we have, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we know that that isn't the most efficient or effective way to do things. So I think another opportunity as you're thinking about making improvements in your state or what you can do is to make sure that you have the right infrastructure in place from a systems perspective. And there are a lot of good providers out there that we would be willing to help. Um, I also think another important factor to note in Colorado three years ago, we were at a situation where um, they had not had pay increases for four consecutive years. So to talk about making changes to a system when individuals had not yet received a pay increase was also um, very difficult to do. So we embarked upon um, a strategy to work on compensation, and I'll come back and talk about that in a moment. Um, but compensation is also important as you think about making some of those changes. I think the more broad and probably uh, the most interesting piece of this is also focusing on leadership. And we'll talk a moment, I have a slide on that um, as we get to it, is to focus on leadership. One of the reasons that most workforces leave or an employee leaves a position isn't because of the compensation. Um, it is because of the leadership that they are having to work with or the staff that they're having to work with. Um, so I made sure that when I took over this position that we had a conversation at a very senior level about do we have the right people in the right seat on the bus to drive us to that success or to that metric um, or strategy that we're trying to implement at that particular time. I think um, one of the other things that to, to consider is the amount of time it takes for change to happen when you're talking about a workforce, particularly those of you who work in states or counties or cities that have um, that are very large, it takes more time to implement the larger your population becomes. Uh, we spoke to about 6,000 employees through the, the course of working on the talent agenda, and it was pretty astonishing that people had the same feeling that I'm speaking with you about. Focus on creating opportunities for the workforce, let's compensate them, and then let's make sure we have the right leadership in place to guide them and set goals and objectives to make them all successful. So as we, as we talk about compensation, what can we do as leaders um, to make sure that we are compensating? In the state of Colorado, we are doing a couple of things. We instituted market pay. We were actually doing a lot of analysis. But one of the things that you should do is to make sure that you are compensating appropriate to your marketplace. Depending on where uh, you sit geographically, that may be you know, more or less in some areas. But I certainly encourage you to do that. So we, we did a lot in terms of chewing up our market ranges um, for a lot of our positions. I noticed um, just one thing right offhand was that there is a lot of change that happens in the Department of Corrections um, for us. And so spending time not only looking at your populations that you have locally, but may, maybe also considering what other states are doing. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to engage with other states to figure out what they're doing around compensation, but I've seen a lot of change um, as it pertains to the Department of Corrections. We also created a merit pay system to reward high-performing employees. So we are tying actual dollars and cents to performance. Um, while it's not a perfect system in the state of Colorado, we have a three-tiered performance evaluation system. Um, I think that we should be moving to look more at a five-tier system. Um, I know this might be a lot of in the weeds and very specific things, but certainly I wanted to mention that because one of the things when we were speaking to the 6,000 or so state employees was it felt like we did not pay attention when it came to performance evaluation and that you either had to walk on water to get that, that three, that top level performance evaluation or everyone was in um, the middle range in terms of having a two, and very few individuals were being performance managed, so we had more than 90% of our population um, in the two. So we are going to be making changes. I think that's something else that you could do in terms of making sure that you're listening to your employees and that you are compensating them appropriately is to look at how you're doing evaluation. That being said, um, again, depending on where you are in a performance range, we provided a compensation strategy that would deal with that. So, for example, 
if you were in a four quartile system, if you were in that first quartile, which means that you were less paid than some of your counterparts, you may have received a higher increase um, in uh, merit pay increase because of that. Additionally, if you perform better, you would also get a higher bump. So in evaluating that, if you were at the high end of the range and you were already being higher paid according to the marketplace, then you received um, a lesser uh, percentage in terms of merit pay. I think another opportunity that we can look at in state government is on spot bonuses. I know that that is probably a practice that most of us don't use enough but I think that there are great opportunities out there when you're having um, your staff and agencies work on special projects that this would be a great um, opportunity to reward them just in time. So I would also highly encourage you from a compensation perspective to think about um, providing that as an opportunity. And they don't have to be large amounts. Um, it can be anything from, you know, $100 um, to $1,000, depending on the size and the scope of that particular project. project. Um, you all might also want to think about, uh, when you're talking about reinvesting in the workforce, uh, is providing something around a wellness program. Um, I think that's also something that's very popular, and if you haven't engaged at all in that space, I think that's a great opportunity and creates a great investment, uh, um, a return on your investment of dollars for states. For example, um, if you focused on preventative health um, and maybe diabetes care and you had less utilization on your health plan, there is a direct return on investment from a dollar's perspective. So I would also encourage you to think about um, ways of getting your staff um, engaged and interested in wellness. We've done a, a few things in the state, and I'll just spend another moment or so discussing that. Um, we've put in a, a new program with a partnership um, with our health providers, and we've created gamey opportunities for people to drink more water, um, walk more, so very little investment on the, the state or agency's part, but certainly creates a lot of opportunity for there to be better health of our state employees. Um, let me also move on and talk a little bit about um, flexibility in the workforce. I think there, that is another way that we can motivate and help with retention, particularly as you're thinking about um, recruiting Generation X and Yers into your space. Um, most of those individuals are going to be looking for opportunities to have flexible time, particularly here in Colorado, um, where we have great outdoors and healthy living. It creates a great opportunity for you to talk to individuals about coming to work for you when you can say you have um, advantages around uh, flex time and flex space. And for those of you who might not be very familiar with either of those concepts, but flex time um, allows you to have flexible work schedules. So individuals who might arrive early or have extended days so they're off every other Friday or half a day on a Friday creates happier employees and therefore happier um, citizens and customers of our um, services. It also helps and decreases in tardiness um, and unscheduled absences. So I would also think about that, and it's important when you're allowing this to make sure that you set up a uniform policy up front um, to address individual needs. I think flex place is also another opportunity. Um, this may work in some contexts, it may not necessarily work in all of them, and I know that we have to be sensitive of that, particularly as a government employer, but allowing individuals to work from home, um, it certainly will reduce the amount of space that you need um, when you're looking at um, dollars and cents in terms of, of um, lease space, et cetera. It also, um, if, you're, if you're doing it correctly, could provide a lot of opportunities for again, um, recruitment of those Generation X and Yers. Um, just a, a little thing on flexibility that I'd also mention of some of the things that we did here in Colorado. Uh, many of you may be familiar with that, that rule of three, which means that an employee under the civil service would not be allowed uh, to interview unless they were one of the top three candidates for a position. And we've expanded that under the governor's talent agenda um, when we ran that statewide legislation to move that to six candidates. 
Um, it does a couple of things, creates more opportunities for hiring managers or appointing authorities to look at great candidates and look more at fit as opposed to meeting the minimum qualifications for a position. Um, and it also creates twice as many opportunities, or for us, created twice as many opportunities for our workforce to be considered for promotional or lateral opportunities in our, our um, organization. Um, I want to move on um, and talk a little bit, because I want to make sure I reserve a little bit of time for questions, and talk a little bit about leadership. Um, I, I think leadership, again, of the things that I've mentioned thus far is probably the most important. Individuals leave because of bad managers and supervisors. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are training your managers and supervisors. One of the things that we're doing in Colorado is uh, working along partners with the legislature on the SMART Act and putting many of our managers and supervisors and senior leaders through um, training programs where they learn to develop meaningful goals and metrics for their organizations. When individuals know where they're going, they're more inclined to, to get there. I also want to mention, um, and it's not on the slide, but we work with um, an individual by the name of Jeff Smart, Dr. Jeff Smart, and he wrote a book called Lediocracy. And one of the things that was important about that and that, that why I'm mentioning it here is there's a lot of opportunities for government to partner with the private sector. Um, and that book really talked a lot about opportunities where a private sector individual could come and work for maybe just two years in state government and help make their, um, their state or their local more productive and effective. Um, and w even speaking about here in Colorado, there are more than, I think, a third of us that are in the governor's administration who actually came from the private sector and were willing to invest for um, possibly eight years of their career through that endeavor. Um, I think just a couple of other quick notes, um, as I, I have a captive audience here to talk about um, being a good leader, and particularly those of you who might be new to the workforce or new to government to think about. Um, one of the, the couple of factoids or, or things that I would or, or encourage you to think about. One is manage up. Make sure that you are never surprise your leaders. Make sure they're very engaged about where you are in the process, not necessarily being in the weeds on every single step, but make sure that they have a very high view, um, overview of where you are in a particular project so that they are never caught off guard on a particular project. Um, own your own project. Make sure that you are the person who at the end of the day are going to be totally accountable, regardless of whether you're delegating responsibilities to others, but make sure as a new leader that you know where you are with your own project, that you've created opportunities for leaders underneath you to engage in that particular project, Hold them accountable by setting um, measurable um, goals, et cetera. And then when the project is complete, I would also encourage you to follow up and evaluate that particular project. How is it working? Um, are there tweaks that need to be made? Um, and what could we have done differently so that when you're rolling out a project in the future, you can take some of those lessons learned. Um, in conclusion, again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. And I want to reserve some time in case there's any questions. All right, at this time we will take questions. And once again, please type them in the box on the right-hand side of the screen. All right, we have a, one right now regarding performance evaluations. The performance evaluation in my pro, excuse me, the performance evaluation process in my state is severely outdated. We are considering an update. What do you think the most important factors to look at when considering how to update this process? I think um, one of the, the most important is to discern whether or not you're going to tie it to any compensation. So I think the first question is whether it's tied to comp compensation or not. Um, two, to make sure whatever you're going to, your performance evaluation, however you're going to do it, has measurable goals in it. And I think those goals need to be in two parts. One, how the person is doing the work, so their behaviors. Um, so it, for those of you who might know a little bit more about human resources, you can certainly, there are individuals who can give you competencies. So some of those behaviors could be developing others. Some could be on communication, oral or written communication. Um, but it's, it's the behaviors on how the work actually gets done. And then there should be a separate section on um, the actual metrics of the work that that person is performing. So how are they doing their particular job? 
And then you should also have a section on comments. Here are the things generally that I think you are really good at, and here are some opportunities I think that you could improve upon, maybe make a recommendation for coursework, et cetera. I think if you have those three um, elements and know whether or not you're going to tie compensation to it, that will give you sort of a, a general template of a good performance evaluation. And there are a lot of vendors. I highly recommend not doing homegrown. I know state mm, governments tend to do a lot of homegrown um, processes, but there are a lot of vendors out there um, throughout the country that would be willing to partner at, I think, a pre pretty reasonable price. Thank you. You mentioned Lediocrity, I believe is the name of the book. Are there any other books or resources that you would recommend for us as we learn more about these topics? Um, I think there are a couple, and I'll give you a couple that come to mind that are government related, and I don't, I apologize, I don't have the name of the author. Uh, the first 90 Days in Government um, is, a, is a good read. Um, I think that that's one. There's an, also another one. I can't remember the name, um, but it was um, a, a person that I believe was in either Missouri or Kansas, and he did a lot of uh, process improvement lean work. Um, and so I, I don't quote me out there, but I think the person's name is last name is Miller, but I'll find out and I'll make sure that I can get that information to you at a later time. But that was also a very good read. I think there's a lot of opportunity out there um, for um, states to actually use the lean process to actually make improvements in their workforce. Um, Non-government related books, um, I love Good to Great. Um, I think Good to Great is a um, really good read, and I actually I had my staff read that. So I think those are some really good ones. Thanks. Most leaders that I've worked for in state government think that turnover is low, when staff feel like turnover is high. Could you please discuss this? Um, so turnover. Uh, I think a good HR person wouldn't give you generalities because I think it depends on the type of work. Um, I think that there is naturally a higher turnover in population of the Department of Corrections than you would see than in some more administrative agencies. Um, I think uh, if you have retention that's in the single digits, then that's pretty much no retention at all from my perspective in government. Um, but again, I think without being general, it's hard to say what a good or poor number is, but your HR individual or your state personnel director should have metrics when it comes to turnover relative to your particular geographic area. A lot of it has to do with um, geographics. A lot of it has to do with the type of work that's being performed. Um, but generally speaking, if you are in the single digits, that's, that's minimal turnover as a rule of thumb. Thank you. Another question. Outside of compensation, what are the most important factors, in your opinion, in retaining a highly qualified workforce? Yeah, and compensation wouldn't even be on the, the list. Um, that's probably a little bit further on the list. I think um, one is whether or not the person is finding any value um, in the work that they perform. We are in the process of completing our second um, employee engagement survey, and that really comes out at the top, um, whether or not people find any value in the work that they're doing. I think that's, that's one. Whether or not they respect their leadership and trust the leadership that they have, that would also be an, uh, a metric or an indicator that you would want to really um, look at to try to influence if you want to reduce the amount of turnover or you want to we'll focus on retention in general. Um, I think, let's see what other ones, I'm just trying to go from my memory here on the ones that I remember specifically. Um, engagement in the work, making a difference in the amount of work, their people, and then I would say compensation would be last. Thank you. This one's a little bit specific. When evaluating human resource information systems, do you think that, or could you discuss the advantages of purchasing a product or creating an H human resource information system in-house? Um, I tend to think that um, if you have a small organization, a very small organization, building something in-house is probably fine. When you are trying to implement um, a, or a statewide um, program, then I think you should probably turn to vendors. And the reason for that is most of them will give you something out of box and it will be a lot cheaper 
um, and a lot simpler to actually train and implement within an organization. So the larger it is, I think the easier it would be to actually get something out of box with a vendor. Um, if you are, again, smaller, then doing something in-house is probably easy. The thing to note is that when you try to build things in-house, you have individuals um, who retire and um, so you lose a lot of that um, knowledge in terms of um, programming, et cetera. And we face some of that in Colorado with having homegrown systems. It's a lot more difficult in terms of making updates uh, to the system. And before we do our last question, I just want to remind the audience that this is the second webinar in a series of three. So next Friday, we will dive into the specific topics of advancement, promotion, and lateral movement with speakers from the Kentucky General Assembly and the Montana House of Representatives. The login process and the time will all be the same, so we look forward to having you join us next Friday. And Kathy, for a final question, as a younger staffer, sometimes I find it difficult to develop new skills because the legislature is a fast-moving environment. Can you give examples of how I can manage up, as you said? Um, I think a, a couple of things. Um, in terms of gathering more knowledge, et cetera, would be, again, this is a great organization, so participating in webinars that you can utilize for a, at a very minimal cost, um, I think are great opportunities. There are a, a few of them out there, um, so I would encourage you to seek those individuals out um, or those organizations out because they would provide a lot of opportunities for learning you know, at a minimal cost, as I indicated. Um, I think um, developing a relationship, having a regular one-on-one -on -one with your direct leadership is also important. Um, and speaking with that individual about creating visibility for you as a new leader, so working on some very significant projects that have visibility or, or other opportunities for you to at least um, be known and can display your talent more broadly um, is another opportunity. And in conclusion, if you submitted a question that didn't get answered, please know that we will reach out to you individually. We have your email address. And thank you very much again, Kathy, for sharing your expertise on the topic. And thank you to the attendees for logging in to today's webinar. We will see everyone on next, week's, next Friday for the next webinar.